You're listening to Maritime Noon on CBC Radio 1, 94.3 FM in Middle River, Cape Breton. Eighteen minutes after 12 o'clock. Most parents agree it's important to motivate your tri- child to do well in school. Encouraging them can be satisfying and rewarding for both of you. But at what point does insisting they reach lofty goals become a detriment to their mental health? Today we're talking about striking a healthy balance. Dr. Simon Sherry is a clinical psychologist and perfectionism expert in Halifax. He's also a professor and director of clinical training with the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University, and he joins us in our studio. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. And the number for our listeners to call, 1-800-565-1940. You can reach us by email at marnoon at cbc.ca. You can also tweet at us at CBC Maritime Noon. So striking the healthy balance. I guess we first have to understand what healthy encouragement looks like and what, I guess, unhealthy badgering, perhaps, looks like. Can you define the two? Absolutely. An unhelpful parenting style that is very much conducive to raising a distressed and perfectionistic kid involves a lot of criticism, demands, and control. And by control, I mean you finish your child's sentences, try and govern their emotions, and play an intrusive role in much of what they think, feel, and do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, on the healthier side of things, more helpful parenting practices would look like having high standards for your child, but supporting them in reaching those high standards avoiding criticism and hostility and undue control, and providing your child with unconditional love and support. So you raised perfectionist there, uh, perfectionism. Is is that key to what we're talking about here today, that uh, person who considers themselves a perfectionist and the impact that the people around them have uh, on trying to attain those goals that they have in mind? Absolutely. Perfectionism is very much a relevant discussion for 2019. My colleagues and I recently studied about 27,000 participants and were able to show that perfectionism is peaking in today's generation. Young adults have never been more perfectionistic than they are today. And why is that? That's in part why we're here to talk about parenting practices. We see two main culprits one being a critical, controlling, and demanding style of parenting, mm-hmm. and the other being the rise of social media and the many perfectionistic images it exposes people to. Okay, what, what kind of images are you talking about there? What's, what's the impact of social media? Take a look at Facebook, take a look at Instagram. People are being inundated with idealized, lofty, and unrealistic images. And what we're finding is that people do a lot of upward social comparison on social media. They tend to look at their neighbors and their friends and see, well, what are their kids doing? Mm -hmm. What kind of vacation do they have? What are they achieving? How are they doing in sports? There are just more and more yardsticks available for social comparison these days. And it's never been harder through the lens of social media, at least, to keep up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking that on the social media side, that's one driver of this rise of perfection. Is it ever helpful to be a perfectionist, or is it always a hindrance? That is a much debated topic in the scientific and clinical literature on perfectionism. I think you'll find here today that I fall on the side of adaptive perfectionism being an oxymoron. In Mm -hmm. many ways, perfectionism is a destructive, if not a pernicious trait. I think maybe we could also say, though, in a bit more neutral terms, that perfectionism can be double-edged. It can push you towards greatness, and it can also push you towards great distress. And that distress often takes a form of depression, anxiety, suicide, disordered eating, and a host of other difficulties. Which are issues that come up perhaps even later 
then uh, as your child is maybe going through grade school, that those, those are things that they hang on to and then really present themselves in a big way later on in life? You can see distressed perfectionists from very early on in life, maybe by grade three, grade four, you can start to see those tendencies emerge. But perfectionism tends to get worse as people age. Perfectionists seem to unravel over time. It may be the cumulative exposure to the stress of living with these perfectionistic expectations. Mm -hmm. It may also be that as roles and responsibilities become more complicated, it's harder to obtain perfection. If you're in high school, maybe it's easy to come close to perfect and there are clearly operationalized definitions for you. You can get 19 out of 20 on a quiz. As you move out into life with its many ambiguities and complexities, it's harder and harder to even know what it is to be the perfect scientist or talk show host. There's no clear definition, mm. and there aren't tests and attaboys along the way to confirm or disconfirm that you're on the right path. Okay, well, let's talk about coping mechanisms then and, and put it in this um, context of homework because for parents listening, for example, that becomes one of those um, touch points, doesn't it? Absolutely. When it comes homework. to uh, achieving your goals in school. So how, what, what are some coping mechanisms or thoughts around how homework is handled? Well, I'm glad we're talking about homework because homework is a great vehicle for building character, for shaping personality. And there are ways you can incline your child toward being conscientious, which is to say disciplined, organized, reliable, dutiful, goal-focused. And there are ways you can act that are going to incline your child to being perfectionistic, which is to say self-critical, self-doubting, feeling really pressured, and feeling like they need to do everything perfect and they can't relax until it's done. I think one thing parents need to encourage, foster, and develop a really strong tolerance for is letting your child make mistakes. Failure is a wonderful teacher. And if you don't let your child make mistakes, if you are really vigilant about them missing even minor parts of their homework or needing them to do it perfect, you are teaching them that small mistakes are major catastrophes that should create great upset. And so let your kid fail, let them mess up, let them take risks, let them be creative. I think that's one part of this, undoubtedly. Another part is don't be so outcome focused. The story I get, almost the archetypal story in perfectionism and parenting is you bring home your test, you got 18 out of 20 on the test, 90% is a pretty darn good mark, and dad, mom, or whomever it is, is focused on those missing two marks. Oh, what happened? Why'd you miss those two marks? And in my mind, that becomes what the child internalizes. They start to realize that anything short of perfect isn't good enough, and they become unduly focused on mistakes. Rather than focusing on outcome, I'd focus on process. When my kid brings home a test, I don't really care how he does. I'm much more interested in how he prepared himself in mm -hmm. the week before. Was he organized? Was he disciplined? Did he study hard? Okay, well, I want to pick up on that point because, yes, we're talking about perfectionism and process, but here's another P word, procrastination. <laughs> Even getting your kids down to study to get that homework done can be an issue. Do you look at procrastination as, as a sign? Uh, what, what meaning do you place on that when you see a child constantly procrastinating? There's absolutely a connection between perfectionism and procrastination. My research team has studied that, as have many other research labs. And we know that perfectionism can be paralytic. You can be overwhelmed by the pressure you feel from yourself or the pressure you feel from others. And that can lead to avoidance. And procrastination and avoidance is a huge problem for perfectionists. When they start to avoid, when they start to disengage, when they look for ways to escape through sort of dead-end behaviors like surfing the internet or playing video games, then they can become really self-critical. And they can you know, use that space, that procrastination as a 
justification to attack themselves. And oftentimes when perfectionists cope avoidantly, that's where you see their problems really come out, like depression, anxiety, excessive stress. So perfectionism is a huge generator of procrastination. Similarly, do you see it as a warning sign when a child gives up uh, on an activity in a huff? You know, perhaps they've been working on something for a little while and they say, I can't get this, and they, they you know, move away in a huff? Yes, and I would uh, move them back because they need to learn how to tolerate failure and have difficulties. And I think as parents, what we want to do is reward their persistence and their hard work and not say, oh, you're so very smart, you're so brilliant, you're so gifted, you have such wonderful genetically endowed gifts. I would not feed a child that line of reasoning. I would say, you're doing okay because you work hard. And if you want to get through this problem, you should sit down and keep working hard and encourage hard work and discipline. Because otherwise, when a child encounters a problem that they can't do perfectly, they pull away from it mm -hmm. and what, quit. What about as a parent, uh, suppose the homework is math, and the parent says, you know what, I had troubles with math when I was going through school too. Does it help to make that connection? with your child to say, let's sit down together. We'll try to figure this out together. I like that voice you just offered because there's compassion. There's empathy in that. The real culprit here today in this conversation isn't high standards. I would say it's good to have high standards for your child. It's when you pair high standards with control and criticism and hostility. If you pair high standards with kindness and patience and compassion, I don't think there's anything wrong with high standards. All right, so what if um, your child is on the other end of the scale, uh, and uh, well, not the child, the parents, and instead of being on top of uh, their child, pushing them to succeed, pushing them to succeed, in fact, they're quite laid back, and it's the child who is laying down the pressure on themselves. That's a different dynamic, isn't it? This is an important point to consider. There isn't just one path that leads you to be a perfectionist and to struggle with the difficulties that perfectionism breeds. There is a route whereby people can become perfectionistic when they grow up in a household where there are few expectations and where no one's around to tell the kid, look, good enough's good enough, and maybe you should put those books away and get to bed because you got to get to school tomorrow. And so sometimes in the absence of parental expectations, children will decide that what I need to do is do things perfectly, and that creates its own problems. All right. Well, we're talking about how to strike a healthy balance when it comes to helping your child succeed. Our guest is Dr. Simon Sherry, who is a clinical psychologist and perfectionism expert in Halifax. The lines are open. Call with your questions or your experiences um, and get some perhaps some feedback as well. The number is 1-800-565-1940. Or email marnoon at cbc.ca. You can also tweet at us at CBC Maritime Noon. First, though, let's touch base with Sandy Smith. He's here with a look at the latest news. Hi, Sandy. Uh, hi, Bob. Jury selection's underway in Fredericton for the panel that's needed to determine if Matthew Raymond is fit to stand trial. He's facing four counts of first-degree murder for the killings of two police officers and two other people in Fredericton in August of last year. A company with tidal power experience in Scotland has applied for permission to create a unit near Long Island, Nova Scotia. Its proposal is for one much smaller than recent experiments that have not worked near Parsborough. And the chaplaincy office at UPEI in Charlottetown is not likely to reopen until the end of this week or this time next week. There was flooding after heavy rain last Tuesday. All the day's news in more detail at 1 o'clock, Bob. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Dr. Simon Sherry, our guest, a clinical psychologist and perfectionism expert in Halifax. 1-800-565-1940 is the number to call. We're talking about how to strike a healthy balance when it comes to helping your child succeed, primarily at school, but uh, maybe there are other situations as well. Dr. Sherry, you were mentioning sports, for an example. How competitive sports are now compared to, say, 20 years or 25 years ago when that first research on perfectionism uh, was done. Quite a difference, isn't there? There's a lot of emerging research on perfectionism in sports, and I can relate to a lot of that research. I'm very much a hockey dad, and we've just passed through hockey tryouts, and expectations and pressures and critical controlling demanding parents are very much evident in that tryout mm -hmm. period. 
And a lot of the research would show that not only are parents quite important when it comes to creating kids who are perfectionistic, but the same holds for coaches. Coaches can be enormously influential in the development of kids, and if those coaches are unduly critical and controlling, that can be harmful to All children. Right. So w what are you saying to your child then as he or she goes through that process? Well, I'm the parent of a 10-year-old hockey goalie, so there's a abundant opportunity to look at mistakes, and all I tell him is all there is is the next shot, But It can be a lonely position, can't it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but he handles it well, and I think he started to develop a mindset that should he be, uh, drop the puck and let one in, that he just focuses on what comes next. He's a pretty forward-thinking kid. Yeah. So in hockey, though, I mean, as you say, it is so competitive. Um, do you see warning signs on the ice Where, of kids who are maybe being pushed too hard or maybe not being pushed hard enough? I don't know what you're seeing. You see an awful lot of pressure and demands put on today's athletes. And unfortunately, what that looks like is when they step out from under the direct control and influence of mom and dad in those early to mid teenage years they start to drop out of the sport they haven't really played for a love of the game they played to try and escape dad's criticism on the way home in the vehicle from their hockey rink and they often just drop out quite early okay so what's what should that conversation sound like in the ride home in the vehicle I think by the time you get around good coaches, it should mostly stay in the dressing room. <laughs> and I'd keep the balance if you're going to say anything about 90% positive and 10% constructive. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll find out a little bit more about this whole issue uh, right now because we're going to go to the phone lines. And Cindy McNeil is calling from Malagash in Nova Scotia. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Are you finding yourself trying to strike a healthy balance when it comes to helping children succeed? Uh, no, it's really more a comment um, of my own experience and trying to strike a balance for myself to succeed as an adult. Okay. Um, more so from the perspective of growing up with a parent who was both a perfectionist with high expectations for schoolwork and someone who didn't have the standards um, or the oversight to encourage when not to per be perfectionist. And how, how has that affected you? Um, I would confirm um, what your guest was saying earlier by saying that it's very strongly related with anxiety and performance anxiety and just social anxiety in general. It just creates this expectation that you must always be everything that everybody tells you you should be. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, I found, I just want to encourage people, I guess, really, that um, with advice and encouragement from other people who don't have that problem, you can learn, even as an adult, to not worry about being a perfectionist. Okay, so it's sort of yeah. unlearning, I guess, or, or, exactly. or moving away from perfectionism, finding out the way to yeah. do that. Dr. Yeah, Sherry, any, exactly. any, any thoughts on that? A lot of relevant and important points here. One idea that Cindy brings up that I like is the idea that pushing someone toward perfection often backfires. You can push your child or you can push yourself relentlessly to try and achieve academic success. But what we find is that perfectionism is linked with procrastination, as we discussed, but also public speaking, anxiety, fear of failure, sometimes even fear of success, anxiety about tests, and a range of other blocks and barriers toward academic success. The other thing I identify in what our caller just said is just this idea that you must be perfect, that you should always be the best. And there's an awful lot of musts and shoulds in perfectionism. The old school psychologist Albert Ellis, who was among the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy, would talk about people masturbating that they say must, I must do this, I must do that. Their mental life is dominated by musts, and that's very much true of perfectionists. There's a lot of shoulds and a lot of musts there. Mm. 
And the last point your caller raises, which I think is a very important one, is that increasingly we do have treatments that have been shown to work and to help perfectionists. You don't have to be a distressed perfectionist for the rest of your life. These are patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving that can change. And so, Cindy, have you found yourself shying away from activities because of oh, your definitely. feelings of, of perfectionism and, and what that's done? Definitely. Absolutely. I have always set a ridiculously, I understand now, a ridiculously high standard for anything I try. I should be should be better than pretty much everybody else and with, what i realize is there's so much freedom and joy of experience when that's not the case hmm. so has part yeah. of the learning process for you been then to engage in those or some activities that perhaps in the past you would have shied away from yes yeah. absolutely and and just to try everything like anything i think i'm really afraid of that that shows up to me as a challenge in my life that I need to attempt that or find a way to be involved in that so that I can break that pattern of thinking. And the fact that you've tried then is more important than what the actual outcome is. Exactly. Well, but that oh. takes a lot of practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and I would, I would comment as far as helping the next generation is that um, something my siblings and I have talked about is that um, from our own experiences, even though I'm not in a position to do it professionally, I definitely try to teach this to the next generation of my own family. Hmm. All right. Great, th yeah. great comments there, Cindy. Much thank for you your very much. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us. Take care. All right, that's Cindy McNeil in Malagash, Nova Scotia. Let's head over to New Brunswick now. Oopkar is on the line from Fredericton. Welcome to Maritime News. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have a question regarding uh, my. Uh, like a four and a half year old son like actually he has just started uh, his schooling and it seems like he feels a little bit isolated and you know although i have put him you know before starting his kindergarten schooling i have put him into uh, like uh, like activities like swimming tennis and all um, and some sport activities um, we are immigrant actually so we immigrated but he was born in here in canada uh, my question is like at one point of time like when he's just started his schooling he 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 uttered me saying like okay the basketball will be or volleyball will be tough for me i don't know how come this this cause this has you know this has emerged in his mind you know um, is this a kind of something uh, some perfectionism he's also uh, started looking into or you know i just wanted to get an idea on that that's why i'm just sort of discussing it uh, okay on this conversation o o or maybe uh, i'm the only it, one that's con confused here but are you saying that y your, your child is perhaps more interested in individual in individualistic sports compared to, to team sports no 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 we just had put him into the like from past one year into different activities just to get an idea like in what in what most interests him but like he in swimming and tennis and um, some um, gym and other activities he's just four year old but at one point of time when he uh, almost started his schooling like in kindergarten just now in september he uttered at one point of time that uh, the, the volleyball will be tough for me or like basketball will be tough for me so i i was just surprised to know like a small kid is saying something like that mm. Uh, how come he's saying that uh, what what has what could have caused him for you know uh, saying so uh, i mean he he's not very great at all the running and sporting activities but he's like he's doing okay not not that bad also but i think uh, with respect to all other uh, people here in canada i think we are more sporty or something but uh, so we are not that somehow we didn't get much chance uh, because we were staying in an apartment right we had some limited and uh, limited space Okay. So, uh, what what could have caused uh, like this mind setup for him like uh, in such a beginning you know age? Yeah, that's a age. great question, and I won't speak specifically about your son because, of course, mm -hmm. I've never met him. But I'll toss out a few ideas for us to consider. First of all, I very much mm -hmm. like that you have a child, and I think it's good for all parents to have children are being exposed mm -hmm. to a diversity of activities. Mm -hmm. That's vitally important. I think for parents who raise perfectionistic kids, they often put way too many eggs in just one basket. So they've got their kid Amazing. who must be... Sorry, 
They... Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, way too many. What did you say? Eggs in like one basket. By that I mean they concentrate all their time, energy, and efforts in one particular activity. That might be school. That might be hockey. I think it's really healthy to have children who are diverse, who are not specialists at age four, or age ten in a particular domain. The other thing I'll point out is that sometimes you will hear self-criticism or fear in children about certain activities, but I think it's important to not have children back away from situations they fear and avoid because of perfectionism. Perfectionism can back you into a very small space in life. If you're only willing to participate in those activities that you can confidently do perfectly, well, then the range of activities that you do will be quite narrow. So despite people having misgivings about making a mistake on a basketball court, a tennis court, or what have you, I think it's good to go out and learn to play, participate, and do without crushing pressure to be perfect. Okay. Um so what should I say to him, like, you know, when, when he has, like, I have not even put him into the basketball and he's saying something, okay, this must be tough for me. So what should I be, like, what words I should really put him put him into his mind, you know, so that he doesn't feel that he is lagging behind or he might lag behind into that, that activities? I think with any child in this sort of situation, you want to be patient, you want to be compassionate, you want to be kind, but you still got to go. And I think okay. not to avoid these situations, not to move away fearfully from them. Don't have fear be what governs what your child does or does not do. Sometimes it's good to show up and see what happens. I think that a lot of perfectionists don't go into situations unless they're confident that what they can do will be done perfectly. And therefore, they avoid many situations in life. They end up not in the game, but on the sidelines of life. Hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank I hope that helps, Upkar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank You're you welcome. for calling. Um, I guess that leads partly to the question of, are perfectionists born perfectionists, or is it really all learned a learned trait? It's definitely a collision between nature and nurture when scientists have tried to disentangle the relative contributions, we've come up with the idea that about 50% of perfectionism may be owing to inheritance and genetics, but written on top of that would be a certain set of environmental experiences, and it seems like the darker forms of perfectionism come from places of adversity where you're exposed to a lot of harsh and difficult parenting. And I think more recently, over the past 25 years or so, uh, rise of iPhone, rise of internet occurring during those periods, we have this new sociocultural influence on perfectionism that is social media. All right. 1-800-565-1940 is the number to call. We're talking about how to strike a healthy balance when it comes to helping your child succeed. And we're going to head to Bathurst, New Brunswick. Next, Jill Bro is on the line. Hi, Jill. Uh, hi, how are you? Good. Uh, yeah, I, I would say um, me. I'm a. I was. I am a perfectionist and and procrastinator and everything goes with it. I think even some people call me uh, uh, a hoarder. But it's, it's because when you're perfectionist, you you might not attempt to do something. You know, like that you might do. And my daughter, she's a she's a veterinarian. And she went to school, and she graduated with honors, and she did her bachelor in uh, biology with honors, and she graduated as a, a veterinarian with honors. And, I, and I'm hoping that she's not perfectionist. You know, I'm hoping she's smart. <laughs> because, are, are you worried? You are you worried that perhaps you've instilled perfectionism in her? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And she, she's a veterinarian, so I would, you know, I, I hope that she's going to be, you know, uh, just being herself and do what she can do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because, like I say, being a perfectionist, it's, it's like you said, it, 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 it brings other things. Like me, I'm, uh, I'm you know, be, being a hoarder or being a, a procrastinator. Uh, I think it all comes from, from that. Because, like, in my life, I was a welder. And as a welder, you have to push yourself 
to do whatever you do, you gotta do it the best because you can't you can't do it halfway. You you have to do it like it's not like a mechanic. When you're a welder, you have to be the best, you know, of what you do. And uh, I don't know, maybe I hope it doesn't uh, come down to my kids being like that. You know. Mm. Well, uh, Jill mentions hoarding and perfectionism. Yeah. Any any known link there? Dr. Sherry, between hoarding and procrastination and perfectionism? Absolutely. There's a few relevant points of discussion. Perfectionism intersects with a number of obsessive, compulsive traits, symptoms, and related behaviors, hoarding being one of them. You'll see that obsessive compulsive disorder consistently involves high levels of perfectionism. A lot of people with, I guess we can call it OCD, have a real fear of making mistakes that's extreme and exaggerated and very perfectionistic. And people with OCD also are very self-doubting about their performance abilities. They'll do something, go back and check to make sure it's all right, then they'll do it again to check to make sure it's all right. And so perfectionism in OCD is often associated with great inefficiency. Something I certainly hear in my clinical practice and and identify with with the current caller and other ideas offered here today is that for, for, for excuse me for perfectionists trying is often a first step toward failure when you have the bar set so high it can create inevitable failure and perfectionists can be okay if they're not very self-critical when they fall short but oftentimes perfectionists experience even minor setbacks as major catastrophes and for perfectionists there's often a black and white style of thinking if I can't be the best I won't do it at all if I'm not first I'm last if I can't do this perfectly I'm not even gonna try hmm. all right Jill well thanks for calling you're welcome I hope I can find a book someday that will it will tell me what to do step by step to be to become uh, uh, not so perfectionist and not a procrastinator. So, I can toss uh, out two ideas for you quickly. One is by a Canadian psychologist called Martin Anthony. It's a decent self-help book, a resource you could get from Chapters. And a second would be a UK-based resource. It's another self-help book, and this time the author is Ross Shaffron. Both of those are decent resources that I have seen others apply to changing around their perfectionism. And here I'm not speaking at all about you in particular, but some people find that they need more than a self-help resource. And if they do, we do have interventions within psychology and psychiatry that have been shown in a preliminary way to help people become less perfectionistic and less distressed by their perfectionism. Okay. Jill, thanks for calling. And I thank you very much. All right. Have a good day, and I enjoyed listening to you. Thank oh, you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's go to Moncton now. Seth Wiggins is on the line. Hi, Seth. Hey. Are you uh, trying to strike a healthy balance when it comes to helping children succeed? Well, personally, I find I found my healthy balance back in about 2012 after I graduated high school. Uh, all my life, I had grown up with a sister who was... I wouldn't say expected to get good grades and do good in school. Uh, she she more she more brought it upon herself with the idea of how of her own like she set her own bar where she wanted to, you know, being getting honors with distinction all throughout high school, and then me coming up behind her six years later, uh, you know, the name the name coming up, you know, all the teachers are like, oh, I remember your sister. She did good. Yeah, well, congratulations. You remember my sister. I'm not going to do as good as her because I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, and I found, I found my balance, regardless of being pushed anyways by my parents uh, to, to always strive to be better. Uh, I found, I found my balance in it with realizing that even if you, it doesn't matter if you barely pass or you pass with 100%, you still completed it. And now, as I'm 25, looking back eight years later, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with where I've landed, with the job I've landed, being, you know, being a red seal mechanic. I have a good job. I have a good life. It, it's It's been, 
I realized that there was no point in worrying throughout middle school and high school about how how well I would about being perfect, living up to the living up to the namesake of doing uh, that was set before me with my sibling. Mm-hmm. It was kind of it was nice to be able to just realize, you know, hey, if you pass, you passed. Yeah. Now that's not saying to strive to only pass. If you know yourself, you can get. 90 95 100 percent if you can do a perfect job do a perfect job but there's no point in beating yourself up over doing a 70 percent on something if that's all you could do well seth you bring up a really interesting dynamic here which is siblings and and what impact that has and melissa also sent us an email uh, on a related matter like this i'm just going to read a very part of it a bit a bit of it she says um she had parents with very high expectations of when it came to came to grades in school. Uh, found homework was a nightmare. Homework was a nightmare. I now have three kids of my own, and I'm trying to avoid putting too much pressure on them to be perfect. My question is: When children in a household have different skills and abilities, similar to what Seth was talking about, how do we avoid having different expectations for their uh, of their performance or creating a rivalry? I'm very glad that both Melissa and Seth introduced the idea of sibling influence. For about 25 years, when we were researching perfectionism, we looked at parents and children. And it's only been in the last few years that my research lab and a few others have started to consider sibling influence. It's an understudied area, and I think it's an enormously important topic. And what we've been able to show in the early research on this is that sibling influence is real. Undoubtedly parents are a big source of perfectionism, but siblings also meaningfully contribute to the pressure you can feel around needing to be perfect or to show yourself off as perfect. So how do you address that in the household? That is a complicated dynamic. I think we're a ways off having a solution. And the other thing that's been interesting as we move from studying parents and siblings and a wider family system is that there isn't a lot of agreement. Sometimes the child will be saying, look, my father is an absolute tyrant who demands perfection of me in everything I do. So we bring dad in and he's like, no, I don't have these demands. I don't have these expectations. There's not necessarily agreement among family members. I do think that it's good to consider that children will have a diversity of strengths Mm -hmm. and that they don't always have to succeed in the narrow academic sense. I think that Seth's example is a cool one. A Red Seal mechanic is a great credential to have. But oftentimes children are fed this narrative, and these would be the young people I bump into in my work at Dalhousie, whereby through guidance counselors, parenting, or just socially approved practices, they end up in university without really ever asking, might I be a better fit for another opportunity? So Seth, as somebody who's gone through it yourself, um, would your advice to Melissa, at least in part, be uh, do the best you can, but as you said earlier, a pass is a pass? And be satisfied with that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, if you, again, like I said, you know, if you can get, if you can get 100% on something, don't don't shortchange yourself uh you know go you know strive to do strive to do the best you yourself know you can but don't don't push yourself you know don't don't set a limit for yourself that you know is going to be unattainable because that can have negative impacts when you do that a hundred percent you can't you can't i mean you can only you can only take personal failure for so long before you start to ask yourself, you know, what, you know, what am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Before you start, you know, you start to, you start to think that there's something personally wrong with you instead of just accepting the fact that it was always there of, you're just not, this just isn't your forte. Yeah. I mean, like, like you were saying before, you know, parents who have, who have issues with math? I suck at math. That is that is one of the things I never I never did good in in school. Uh, it was 
I mean, it just wasn't something I did good at. So I did my best in it, and I put, I did my best in it to pass, and I put the effort that I could have put beating myself up over it and constantly trying to beat my head against the brick wall that was the not the lack of comprehension of math and the fundamentals of it. And I took that energy and that study time and I put it towards courses like my mechanical work and my love of biology and chemistry and those those aspects in school. I mean I went I took those mm-hmm. courses and I took the courses I could I knew I could pass and I just used that energy into something I enjoyed. All right. And then just making it a lot better of a time. Well, glad to hear you've had uh, lots of success uh, since your school days. Seth, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it very much. We're almost out of time, Dr. Sherry. Um, f- closing thoughts just on, on, on maybe what Seth was saying there, but also generally if you're combating perfectionism and, and maybe on that sibling question. When it comes to perfectionism, whether it's something you're wrestling with yourself or whether it's parenting practices you're considering, I think you have to figure out when is good enough, good enough. And that can be very liberating. If you can accept that you'll be imperfect in certain areas in your life, it often frees up opportunities for you to pursue things that you're truly passionate about. Perfectionists can get into trouble when they are ceaseless and relentless in the pursuit of perfection in everything. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for coming in. Great conversation. Thank you for having me, Bob. That's Dr. Simon Sherry. He's a clinical psychologist and perfectionism expert in Halifax. You can still have your say. Leave a message, 1-800-565-5463. Our email, marnoon at cbc.ca. I'm Bob Murphy. Thanks for listening. Have a great afternoon.